Rewind back to the start of the season, and we had a proven winner entering the Formula 1 grid. No, not Oscar Piastri. Nick de Vries had come off the back of winning Formula 2 in 2019 and Formula E in 2021, so he was set to burst into Formula 1 with Alpha Tauri and already be one of the top drivers on the grid. However, I think it's safe to say his 10 race Formula 1 stint probably wasn't the highlight of his racing career that he had hoped for. But was it actually as bad as everyone thinks? Let's break down every race we saw from Nick DeVries and see if he was as terrible as some of the other rookies we've seen in recent seasons, or if he was unlucky to get sacked so soon. Let's start right at the beginning with pre-season testing and set out the landscape that Nick DeVries was entering. First, he was coming into an Alpha Tauri team that, behind the scenes, was in a massive state of change. We didn't know it at the time, but I'm sure Red Bull were already aware that Franz Tost would be stepping down after 18 years in charge of the team. And second, the whole team was going to be revamped for the 2024 season anyway. This would be the final season of Alpha Tauri as we know it, which puts Nick DeVries in a weird headspace because he's coming in, he's learning the ins and outs of the team, knowing that next year he's going to have to relearn it all over again because everything is about to change. Whilst also taking into account that he's replacing a very talented driver in Pierre Gasly who left of his own accord. I think it's different when you're replacing a driver that's been fired, but Pierre Gasly had been the main man at Alpha Tauri for a good few seasons whilst Yuki Tsunoda was being integrated into the team, and even managed to win a race for the team back in 2020. And I'm not saying that the team would have been expecting Nick to win a race, but I do think he would have felt the pressure of replacing such a key member of the team. Also, the fact that he's actually five years older than Tsunoda and a year older than Pierre Gasly, who he's replacing, and is the rookie in that dynamic, must have felt quite strange. But to be fair, none of that matters as long as you deliver out on track. It's difficult to remember considering everything that's to come, but Nick DeVries' second race weekend in Formula 1 didn't go too badly. Don't get me wrong, DeVries never looked to have Sonoda's level of speed in the Alpha Tauri and seemed less comfortable in the car than his teammate, but he is a rookie and all three rookies had a gap to their teammate. We have to kind of expect that. I feel like a pretty scruffy final Q1 lap made the pace gap look pretty bad because he ended up 7 tenths off Sonoda in qualifying, but in reality, the gap wasn't actually that wide, which was shown on Sunday where his race pace was pretty much on even terms with Sonoda and was decent enough. Sonoda finished ahead in 11th where Nick DeVries finished in 14th, but the team decided to gamble by splitting strategies under the virtual safety car, leaving Nick DeVries out, which really didn't work. So overall, I would say that it was a pretty decent debut and we have definitely seen a lot worse in Bahrain from rookies recently. And as we moved into the second round in Saudi Arabia, again, he had a pretty decent weekend. When I had the idea of making this video, I thought it would be bad from the beginning and we just look at how terrible he was throughout. But actually, overall, Saudi Arabia was a step in the right direction. He missed out on free practice three due to an engine problem, but that's completely out of his hands. That did lead him to being a little bit out of shape in qualifying. On his first flying lap, he misjudged the braking zone down into turn one and spun the car, but he didn't cause any damage to to the car other than to his tires and to his ego but in the race itself once again he made up places starting in 18th finishing in 14th he complained about losing momentum on both the start and the restart he was a little bit slow off the line in both cases but overall it felt like the weekend was another step in the right direction as i said before and that he was doing okay in formula one it wasn't until Australia where the story started to change just a little bit. He didn't do anything wrong necessarily, but there was a floor upgrade that Alpha Tauri decided to add only to Nick DeVries' car for this weekend's action, which we found out later on in the season should have gained him a tenth or two on his teammate. Instead, Nick DeVries was again the slower Alpha Tauri car. He made another mistake on his final flying lap in qualifying, which cost him a chance at his first Q2 session. And again, it was a small mistake, but it's now three small mistakes in three qualifying sessions, followed up by his worst race so far. He drifted wide at turn three whilst Esteban Ocon was alongside him and was sent spinning by the Alpine. So the team once again opted for an outside of the box strategy to try and make up for a slightly poor qualifying and the early spin, which he 
really couldn't make work on his tires. He was then forced into a second stop for another set of soft compound tires, and that then left him at the mercy of Logan Sargent as the American rear-ended Nick DeVries and left the Alpha Tauri in the gravel at the final standing restart. It wasn't a disaster weekend, but it was the first weekend where questions started to be asked of Nick, especially with a certain Australian president on the Red Bull pit wall for his home Grand Prix. And maybe the Australian weekend really got into his head, because in Azerbaijan, he put in one of the worst weekend performances that I can remember. In his defense, it was his first ever sprint weekend in Formula 1, but he did make it four mistakes in qualifying from four sessions, with this being the worst of the lot so far, as he ended up in the wall on his first push lap in Q1 after breaking too late for turn three. And as we've seen from other drivers, smashing your car during a sprint weekend is a recipe for disaster. Then on Saturday, during the first sprint qualifying, he wasn't able to set a serious lap time, he had front tyre temperature problems, a trip down an escape road, and then a red flag. The sprint itself maybe contains the one silver lining of the weekend for the Dutchman. It is a small silver lining because he also committed a Formula 1 sin when he had a brush with his teammate on the opening lap of the sprint race, but despite that he managed a solid run to 14th place. However, on Sunday, it was an absolute disaster. He clipped the inside wall at turn five whilst chasing Kevin Magnussen and Joe Guang Yu on lap 10, meaning that he damaged his suspension and sent himself into the barrier just really slowly for the second time this weekend. Probably a three days that he won't want to be reminded of. So he really needed a solid and clean weekend in Miami to make up for Baku, which remarkably looked to be coming towards him. Nick DeVries finally put together a lap in qualifying without making any kind of mistake and he showed what he can do when he puts a full lap together. He made it into Q2 and out qualified his teammate Yuki Tsunoda, who was having a great start to the 2023 season. All he had to do was put in a half decent race performance, which he's capable of, we've seen it in the first three race weekends of the year. So on the opening lap, he smashes into the back of Lando Norris and undoes all of the positivity of his qualifying. He got away from the clash with the McLaren without any major damage, but as he continued, he noticed a vibration, which he said after the race he did have to manage, meaning what could have been a redemption race turned into a quiet afternoon at the back, leaving his teammate Yuki Tsunoda to once again show off the race pace of the Alpha Tower picking up another 11th place finish. And it has to be said that Sonoda has either finished 10th or 11th in all five of the opening races, where Nick DeVries' average finish was 15th. So after both Baku and Miami being a disaster, it seemed like it's starting to really fall apart for Nick DeVries, and with Monaco coming up, I didn't hold up much hope. But considering Monaco is one of the trickiest Grand Prix weekends of the entire season, we know how tight that circuit can be, especially when it starts to rain, he did pretty great. Don't get me wrong, he didn't have the edge of pace that Sonoda showed with the Japanese driver qualifying in the top 10, but that wasn't a massive deal for Nick DeVries, as he was just desperately in need of a clean weekend at Monaco, even if it was slow, and he produced that weekend and actually wasn't too slow. He qualified in 12th place, kept himself out of trouble, and played the team game in the race by backing up Valtteri Bottas to help out Yuki. Remember, this was when Alpha Tauri were on the periphery of points quite often, so a long first stint meant that he could pit just as the rain came. He did stop just after Valtteri Bottas, meaning he lost the position to an undercut, but Yuki Sonoda's mistake was what cost the team their points. Nick DeVries finished in 12th place, his highest finish of the season, and overall put in a solid Solid weekend, which he then looked to be building upon as Nick DeVries put together easily his strongest Formula 1 weekend right up until when it mattered in qualifying, where he was twice caught out by that invisible damp patch in Spain that made quite a few drivers lose a lap at turn 11. That wet patch led to two spins, two damaged sets of tyres, and exiting qualifying during Q2. Although he did qualify in front of his teammate, he dropped back to 16th place at the start, getting boxed in at turn one, and it was that start that really cost him dearly. A first stint in traffic meant that he had no chance of joining Sonoda in points contention, and whilst his teammate was battling Joe Guang Yu for points, Nick DeVries again was driving around only really battling for pride. It's a difficult one to judge this weekend. He was having a great weekend and overall produced a decent race. Ideally, he would have been able to turn his pace advantage into at least a points battle, if not points themselves, but despite the result, he looks like he might finally have a handle on that Alpha Tauri car. 
which was then proved not to be the case when we moved to the Canadian weekend, which feels like the start of the end for Nick DeVries. It was a largely nothing weekend for Nick, who just couldn't get to grips with the car, especially with the added difficulty with fluctuating weather conditions, but that's what you get in Canada, and a combination of this lack of out and out pace as well as traffic led to another disappointing Q1 exit. It was another session that was filled with little mistakes and it did start to feel like he'd never quite get to grips with qualifying in Formula 1. The race though would see the start of Nick's first and only on-track rivalry come to a head as he became tangled in a battle with Kevin Magnussen, first clashing, exiting turn one, and then locking up into turn three and sending himself and Kevin up the escape road. It was quite an entertaining piece of driving, although it did highlight that he's still struggling with how to battle wheel to wheel in these cars, and that Alpha Tauri was starting to get frustrated as he made another error during the racing, and they were expecting quite a reliable driver in Nick de Vries. Although I seem to remember the Austrian Grand Prix being where the pressure on de Vries took an even bigger jump, obviously it being the Red Bull ring there's an added scrutiny on the Red Bull drivers, it's almost like a second home Grand Prix, a bit like Ferrari and Monza, even though neither Ferrari driver is Italian there's an added expectation to perform, and Nick de Vries just, well, didn't. You could see that he was really trying to push the car in qualifying and force the car through the corners, but this overdriving led to him unsuccessfully attempting to carry too much speed in his final qualifying lap, meaning he ended up smashing into curbs, losing time and qualifying in last place. But most importantly, next to Kevin Magnussen. Saturday was better, with a better performance in damp conditions during SQ1, but he again struggled in the tricky conditions during the sprint, and then on Sunday is where the real talking points were. He once again met with his friend Kevin, where he picked up a penalty for forcing Kevin Magnussen off the track, which led to Kevin Magnussen saying that Nick DeVries driving reflects that he is in a desperate situation and is racing for his future in Formula 1. How correct Kevin would go on to be is pretty insane. That that penalty, plus a Hall of Track Limits penalties, meant that there was no chance of Nick DeVries coming away with any praise from this weekend, even though he did finish above his teammate. Which led to his final Grand Prix at Silverstone, and possibly his most anonymous weekend. There really wasn't anything overly dramatic to talk about here. On paper, his qualifying looks terrible, as De Vries was half a second slower than Sonoda in Q1, but that's because his qualifying effectively became a one-lap shootout after the red flag, and he messed up that one lap, but the gap to his AlphaTauri teammate throughout practice was much smaller, and even with that gap, he was only two spots behind. But again, it was another qualifying that didn't go to plan. Then in the race, he didn't do anything particularly wrong. Actually, he put in a pretty decent first stint, running long on the soft compound tyres, which was a strategy he could have made work, only to stop just before the virtual safety car. It was possibly the unluckiest pit stop that he could have had, and that condemned him to driving around at the back with his teammate, who he matched for race pace, but again, couldn't get in front of. It was a good weekend for him. He got quite unlucky in both qualifying and the race, but it was just quite an underwhelming way to end your stint in Formula One. Although I do feel like we have to address the Daniel Ricciardo shaped elephant in the room. Had it just been juniors waiting in the wings, Nick DeVries' story may have been different, but having an eight time Grand Prix winner just over your shoulder doesn't make life easy. And then of course came the Pirelli tyre test at Silverstone, where Daniel Ricciardo effectively forced Red Bull's hand. In a recent interview he said, I did the first run with those couple of spins, came back in, so did maybe eight laps or something, maybe ten. We put some new tyres on, we put FP2 fuel in the car, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it, the first timed lap I did was on the money. It was a few hundredths off Max's pole time. So if you're Red Bull and you have the option to put in what what seems to be a confident and revitalized Daniel Ricciardo into your car, instead of a so far underwhelming Nick De Vries, I mean you'd be silly not to. However, back to Nick De Vries' performances across 10 weekends, he managed an average qualifying position of 16.6 and an average finishing position of 15.4 with two DNFs to his name. And I think looking back at each weekend, he had five good weekends where he performed as you'd probably expect being a rookie in Formula 1, but there were no amazing performances. And then you contradict that with four bad weekends, one absolutely terrible weekend, and the fact that Daniel Ricciardo was waiting in the wings 
and I can see why Red Bull decided to pull the trigger, but I don't think Nick DeVries was as terrible as everyone remembers him being. The real problem was that he wasn't closing the gap to Yuki Tsunoda on a consistent basis. He got closer at points, but not really close enough, and he also lacked quite a lot of the racecraft knowledge that you'd expect from someone of his pedigree in other series. He often lost places off the start line, he was compromised on his strategy, he also made countless errors when overtaking or in wheel-to-wheel -wheel battles, so even though he put in five good performances, there wasn't, as I said before, a standout performance akin to his outing in Monza in 2022, which got him onto the grid in the first place. I did feel for Nick DeVries in all of this. I think we've all been there where you work so hard for something and then it just doesn't quite happen how you wanted it to, and for him, he's put his whole life into this goal to be amongst the likes of Stroll and Albon as he was coming through the ranks and to finally join them on the Formula 1 grid, that must have been the highest of highs in his entire life, only for his dream race seat to be snatched away from him six months later. And there's nothing you can do at that point, it's just suddenly over. Did he deserve to be thrown out like that? Did he have enough time? In my opinion, probably not, but so much of Formula 1 is being in the right place at the right time, which unfortunately just really wasn't the case for Nick DeVries. But I'd love to know your thoughts on Nick DeVries. Now that we've had time to let the 2023 season settle down, do you think he deserved to be replaced when he was? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. And if you've enjoyed this video, I also made this video here on Lance Stroll's controversial rise into Formula One. So click that link and I'll see you over there. Lance Stroll's path through the junior categories attracted a lot of positive and negative attention. Even the first step in Lance Stroll's rise into Formula One was covered in controversy. Back in 2010, 